right? There was a class that I took. It was actually a pretty boring class, but it's going to pay dividends now. Um, and yeah, I did, I kind of fell asleep every once in a while, but it was environmental physiology, right? And the professor was just kind of really boring. It was a cool course in a sense, but the professor was boring. But anyway, <clears throat> it was talking about altitude, right? And obviously when you're climbing mountains, you're going to get to altitude. It's going to mm -hmm. be very difficult. So one of the things you're going to need to do is altitude training. You're obviously going to need to train, like do a lot of climbing at altitude. One of the problems though is when you live at altitude and you're climbing at altitude, your endurance is really low. And so you can't train as high intensities. So there's maladaptations that you get. So you want to, one thought, that, so, so some athletes have had the concept of train low or um, basically like um, train low, sleep high. Well, how many people are going to like train low because they could train high intensity, there's more oxygen, but sleep high so you get oxygen adaptations. Um, because look, you're not going to fly to, on a helicopter every day at the top. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Cool idea too. But it's, <laughs> but it's hard to do every day. Right. So basically what, what some people do is they get this tent where it's like oxygen deprived. So if you're, you can't train at altitude all the time, but you can sleep at altitude. So slowly choke yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you're sleeping in an oxygen deprived like a, a thing every single day. You, Cause you're not going to be at the top of that mountain all the time. When you start to reach altitude, that's where you're going to get gas. So obviously you've been training a long time. You must be climbing a lot, but make sure that you actually uh, are, are sleeping at altitude, even if it's simulated and that will help a lot. So the other thing I'm going to recommend, Lawrence talks about a ketogenic diet. Studies show that on a ketogenic diet, you don't need as much oxygen, that you're more efficient. Mm. In fact, when you run, like you're not using as much oxygen to the same level. So I'd highly recommend that you um, uh, take exogenous ketones, Definitely do that, um, and uh, also be on a ketogenic diet. Mm, that's a great tip. So that's my insight on from grad school environmental <laughs> physiology. So I think here's one that both you guys can answer. I know Lawrence has talked about this a little bit, um, especially given the past year. We're getting questions about uh, how you've been working out more recently, mm -hmm. which is obviously not existent. So. <laughs> If we were to ask this question this time last year, what would your answer have been last year? So what was it actually? How have you been working out recently? Um, so yeah, if I, if I was working out and I just started again, um, working out recently, it's just a lot of compound lifts. I think that's a great base to get that core strength up and help out with some flexibility issues. Like for me personally, I like to go full ass to the grass squats. And I think that's a great way to start training with just Simple compound lifts, squats, bench press, shoulder press, and some pull-ups. So, oh, deadlifts too, sorry. So, I know you love those. <laughs> yeah. so, so, Lawrence, you getting back into it, right? You're going to gain a ton of size. Mm -hmm. So you're starting with these compound movements and you're going high volume to start? I'm going, um, I'm still doing like the power uh, bodybuilding style where there's a lot of uh, monster sets and a lot of high volume. <clears throat> and then in the... Middle phase of the workout, there will be a compound lift that's still very heavy, but for two to three sets of eight to 10 reps, somewhere in between there, just so I can feel the uh, real weight again as I'm slowly transitioning phases. Mm, good points. So we have a lot of people uh, that think Lawrence is going to have a bit of a hard time getting that much weight <clears throat> in eight weeks. Um, I think this might be a good time to kind of talk about how muscle memory might play a role in that. Oh, a lot yeah. of people don't realize Lawrence is, you know, he's a I'm 30 bit, pounds lighter than I usually am. Right. Well, so that's huge. How easy, how much easier it, will it be for him to gain that weight back with that being the, the uh, situation? <clears throat> well, let me say this. One thing about Lawrence is we had a big interview. We just did like a, almost an hour interview and you guys definitely are going to check that out. It's going to be super cool. But the thing to understand um, is that there is a such thing as muscle memory. What happens is that <clears throat> your muscles have like these little computers on them that store information, right? But you guys have heard of a, a nucleus, I'm sure some of you guys, you know, some of you are like, no, I've never heard of a nucleus. Well, there's these control centers on muscle, and they're called nuclei, and they're all around the muscle. And even though Lawrence stopped training, and um, uh, his lean mass went down about 10 pounds, okay? But the muscle he has still has all that memory all around it. Those, because when he trains, you add nuclei, they stay there. Mm -hmm. So now, when he starts to train again, they know what to do. So they will automatically kick into gear, and he actually can gain mass at that fast rate. So it's, there's also, there's muscle memory in the muscle, and then there's the nervous system. So, like, think about it. When you start training again, Lawrence can feel those movements right away. 
You know what I mean? So he gets that mind muscle connection much better than if he had never trained at all, right? Um, but you're definitely going to put on a lot of mass. I think most people forget the fact that there's over 15 years <clears throat> of training that I've been doing and understanding your body. Like I've been working with Dr. Jacob and teams of doctors for 10 years trying to understand my body on a microscopic level to where most people don't understand their bodies on a just a normal level. Like I get my VO2 tests done all the time. I get metabolic cards. I have my blood work done twice a year at, at minimum. So I'm always working on my body and checking it out and I'm trying to understand it more and more so where you can fine tune it. So the older you get, you know mm -hmm. what foods process with you a little bit better. Like I'm lactose intolerant, so I can't take too much dairy, but I understand the times now of when I can take dairy and what dairy I can take. I can take a whey protein shake that has most of the lactose out and heavy whipping cream doesn't upset my stomach but regular cheeses do, and I actually lose weight by the more cheese I have because I can't actually process um, the dairy and too much blood stays in my stomach. So small little things like that, which I think people forget um, that goes inside of training besides working out is the nutrition and how much nutrition really plays inside of and nutrition timing as well. Right, right. And I think you look at like, listen guys, Lawrence is close to superhuman. You know what I mean? It's like, most of the people watching this, they're not going to be able to eat 20 eggs, a half a pound of bacon, and a carton of, of heavy cream, and a salad. You know what I mean? I mean, mm -hmm. it's like, it's just like, most people aren't going to be able to do 500 reps every single workout. Like, this is superhuman stuff. And, but it took years to get there. And it took years to get there. But you don't, let me say this. When you turn on the television on Sunday and you watch an NFL pro athlete, right, you don't judge what can be done. You don't like um, just look at him and go, oh, I can't do this or whatever like that. In other words, he might be able to do other things that you might not be able to do. It doesn't mean that it's not humanly possible. It just means you haven't done it year after year over and over. It's just been small little fine tunes and just a lot of work over 15, almost 20 years. Yeah. Oh, God, almost 20 years. Oh, yeah. Crap. yeah. Take that part out. <laughs> oh, crap, we're live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but the thing is, and a lot of you guys watching this, in 10 years might be like the next Lawrence Ballinger or something Hopefully like better. that. You know, <laughs> you I want to give so much information just like you that's do the point. to where the younger generation doesn't have to go through the injuries or the hardships that we had to go through to learn the information. That's the point. That's the <clears> point. I think this is a good one for uh, both you guys to touch on. Uh, what do you think about waist trainers or even using like the vacuum pose to reduce your weight size? Well, so, okay, so I'll, I'll talk about the vacuum pose type of thing, because Frank Zane was, was the best person ever yes. to do that, and if you watch old school bodybuilding films, there's a, there's a bodybuilding film called The Comeback, it's like a, it was a film, you have to like, when I was looking for old school films like Pumping Iron, this is old school, and you have to, it's probably on YouTube, it's called The Comeback, and it's like, it's, it's when Arnold Schwarzenegger came back. Oh, and can we make that? Can we do this comeback too? Side note: the comeback too. <laughs> well, this is going to be a comeback too. It's going to his comeback this year, um, and it was badass because Arnold Schwarzenegger came out. He was going against um, Frank Zane, who I think was reigning Mr. Olympia at the time. Oh, back in the what seventies? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And and it was in uh, um, it was nineteen eighty film at the time. Nineteen eighty. It was okay. not the comeback. Really, it should be. But they have posing routines from there. Tom Platts. And you see Tom Platts. For you guys who don't know Tom Platts, one of the greatest bodybuilders, mm -hmm. the one of the most hardcore bodybuilders. With the biggest damn, I mean, with the biggest legs. You've ever biggest seen. <laughs> legs you've ever seen, right? And he he didn't start counting until it hurt. So anyway, um, uh, but he did this vacuum pose, and it was the most amazing pose ever, mm -hmm. right? Ever. So I do think, from a bodybuilding perspective, posing is really important, mm -hmm. and learning how to pose and train so that your waist looks smaller is certainly important from that standpoint. Um, now, there are people who do crazy things like, you know, get ribs removed and like, you know, have these tight core sets that restructure their bones almost, you know, like if you wear braces that restructure your teeth, mm -hmm. they'll do that to their ribs. Listen, I don't recommend that. I don't recommend doing that to yourself, but I do recommend learning how to pose and making your waist smaller. I love the vacuum pose just because I feel like it helps you hold in your core um, when you're not competing. So it gives you the optical illusion of a smaller waist. But if you want a smaller waist, I don't like wa waist trainers personally. I feel like they mush your muscles and abs together where you don't have the detail. <clears throat> Make your lats bigger. Make your shoulders wider. Voila, you have a smaller waist now. You don't look like a cereal box. This is great what Lawrence is saying, and it goes to the art of bodybuilding. 
So if you look, think about what bodybuilding's really rooted in. It's like rooted in a lot in Greek culture. Mm-hmm. So if you go back to the Greeks, they had some of the greatest sculptures of all time, right? And what do you see? They had rules for when they were actually developing these sculptures. And those rules were based on proportion mm-hmm. and they were based on symmetry. So if you look like a guy like Lawrence, if his arms grow an inch or a half inch, he knows that proportionally other body parts have to grow. And so it, it is like a sculpture. If you make your shoulders wider, it makes your waist look small, smaller. If you make the outer quad suite bigger, it makes the waist look smaller. You know what I mean? So there, you make the laps bigger. It makes the waist look smaller. So I think there are things that you can do from an illusion standpoint, from a sculpting standpoint, that really make body modeling a complex sport and art. Yeah, I think illusion is the number one thing on that. Just work on your illusion and figure out maybe which poses work best for you, which body part, other body parts you need to pick up will definitely help. And just understanding that everybody is really different. Look at Ben Pulowski. He, not to be, I love Ben. He's a good friend of mine. He does not have a great physique, but he turned that crap, not crap, just subpar physique into one of the best physiques in bodybuilding, period, in the history of bodybuilding by understanding how to weak point train and make the optical illusion come out. He did, yeah, he did, definitely. Is there a big difference between a waist trainer and a belt? Or do you have anything to say about the guys who walk around the gym with just a belt on the whole time? <laughs> like the freak? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, you, okay. Uh, <laughs> you put the belt on, is it going to do the same thing a waist trainer does? I don't personally believe so. I think just a belt's there either just to make your <laughs> shirt look cool so girls can see you got a V-taper. I am, uh... <laughs> I'm guilty of that. I know sometimes <laughs> I do try to thirst trap when I'm at the gym by myself. It is what it is. I'm single. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think it does the same as a waist trainer. Yeah. Especially yeah. with the thinner belts. Yeah. Well, if you can wear your belt throughout your entire workout, it's not tight. Though. True. You're not no. wearing a belt. Though. No. It's not for the same purpose. Right. I, I definitely You're not agree. using it how you're supposed to use it. No. Uh, so this mm-hmm. one give me uh, another one you guys can both kind of talk about. How often do you switch up the training program? Well, um, I know one of the things I know Lawrence going going to the program you're doing now. Now, how often do you switch up your training? Um, probably every month to two months. It's not really switching up. I say it's more of a progression because as you're training, something gets stronger, something gets weaker. Your body's always adjusting to whatever you're doing. So if I'm lifting heavier, I'm probably losing endurance. If I'm losing endurance, I probably need to gain strength. If I'm gaining strength, I'm probably losing power. So it's just there's give and takes. So I'm just trying to stay well-rounded all, all through here. And Lawrence goes into more detail on that, like on our in-depth interview that we filmed today. He goes into that strategy. I would definitely stay tuned for like that interview because he goes into depth of like how he progresses but sustains <clears throat> what he gained from the previous cycles. It's, it's pretty interesting. And I think the point, guys, is this. If you're going to never stop growing, you've got to constantly change and progress, constantly change mm-hmm. and progress. So, you know, I mean – you know, like I've seen Lawrence, he has variation within his workouts, but then he has an overall goal. You know what I mean? He might be focusing for a phase on high volume. He might be focused for a phase where his main goal is strength. And then within workouts, he's changing it up. You know, mm-hmm. micro changes kind of every workout. But the theme might change every four weeks or so. Right. So for Lawrence, <clears throat> what are your thoughts on fat burners? I personally don't like fat burners. Um, it's not that they don't work, and that's not what I'm trying to say. I like to rely more on my actual nutrition than a supplement to help with fat burning. Usually that's a kind of crutch for you not doing your cardio or something of that nature. Because if something's only going to help me anywhere between 2 to 5%, um, give me like a 2 to 5% advantage, for most people that's not like a elite bodybuilder, it's, you won't even notice the difference, to be honest with you that you can actually save that money and put into something that's going to be better for you, like a protein shake or creatine or electrolytes or some type of micronutrient or even just paying off your gym bill. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And I think a lot of people get dependent on it. Because mm-hmm. it's more of a caffeine source that most people get dependent off of versus the actual thermogenic effects of it. Is there any placebo effects with that or anything else? Uh, there's probably definitely, there's a lot of placebo effects with almost everything you mm-hmm. take. And then anytime you take a new supplement, even if it doesn't work, it works. Do you remember the when beta alanine came out oh, yeah. and everybody felt like a monster and it was like the thing you had to have, like five grams of beta alanine yeah. in your pre-workout? Oh, I know. I know. 
you don't need that you much, don't. but it's made you, you tingle and feel like a monster. So it does. you're like, oh, I can rep out 500 for 10 reps now. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, and there you go. That's the Sword placebo. Effect. That's why everyone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why everyone puts beta alanine in everything because it tingles mm -hmm. and it's a feeling, so you know it's working. Doc, how would you structure protein intake on a 16-8 intermittent fast? Ooh, that's a that's a good question. Oh, that's a tough one. Listen, I think if you're structuring protein intake around that. Make sure that like you're probably training like right when you're about to break the fast, like with your lift, and then you have protein like right immediately after that. And then, um, would and you then, recommend like a fast digesting protein or? Yeah, I probably have a fast digesting protein. Good point. Right after you work out, if you haven't eaten for a long time, you need to get protein synthesis going. And then I would you know, spread it out, you know, two to three. Have probably maximize that eight hours. Mm -hmm. You probably at least have try and get three or four servings of protein throughout that time. What kind of cardio would you recommend uh, for mountain climbing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a, great, that's a great question. Um, I mean, look, man. Mountain, mountain climbers. climbers. <laughs> mountain climbers. Yeah, mountain climbers. Mountain climbers. I would recommend mountain climbers. I'd recommend mountain climbers. Oh, a climbers. Jacob's Ladder at a vertical incline. A that's Jacob's Ladder at a vertical mean. incline. Um, I would definitely, yeah, mountain climbers, Jacob's Ladder, um, any, remember, everything's about specificity, guys. Uh, you know, everything's about specificity. So, um, you know, make sure you're doing, like, um, uh, lots of well, mountain climbers, I guess. <laughs> That's probably the, my best answer. Go climb a mountain. Go climb a mountain. Every be practical day. in everything that you do. If you want to be able to pull a semi-truck, start by pulling a car and work yeah. your way up. Yeah. That should probably be your cardio. Like, just, like, go find a small mountain and at least climb it for 30 minutes a day <laughs> or an hour a day or something like that. Add some weight to your back so it's, it's like you're hiking and yeah. get to moving. Yeah. Right. It's just like moderate intensity, continuous stuff. Push and pull a sled, mm -hmm. add yeah. weight to your backpack, walk around. I mean, it's yeah. just stuff like that. Yeah. Replicate your goal as best you can. That's right. So here's an interesting one that there could be a lot of factors involved. We have somebody asking why they always wake up heavier after leg day even though their diet didn't change. Oh, that's a really good question. Probably because you have a lot of edema, mm -hmm. your your muscles are, are damaged, and you have a lot of inflammation, so you're heavier. And sometimes when you don't drink enough water, you actually store extra water inside the muscles, and you're not flushing out your lactic acid, and a few other little things that's popping through. So stay hydrated too. How many rest days per week do you recommend for intermediate climbing? That's a good question. Um, you know, I think that everyone should train every body part, even intermediate, at least twice a week, probably, mm -hmm. especially intermediate, because like you train your, you have two back days, for example, mm -hmm. but I would say at least train every body part at least twice a week. So it all depends. When you say intermediate, if you've been training for one to three years, you could, it depends on your training split, right? So if you're doing like push, pull or upper, lower, whatever that, that training split will dictate the frequency that you train. Mm -hmm. So, you know, probably take two days a week off, you know, two to three days a week off. For but you can listen to your body too. I think as time goes on, you'll be able to kind of tell if that body part needs a break. If you're still really sore, <clears throat> like a seven out of 10, yeah. then take that day off. And sometime your body won't be able to say, okay, Thursday's my day off. You might be able to work out on that Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday when you're sore, stop. Dummy, it's some, I'm sorry, but it's just listen to your body. It's, yeah. it's most people just never listen to their body, try and follow us instructions too tight. Well, that's a really good point, too, because I think basically what, guys are hardcore, and I get it, but like say you have two days off during a week, be flexible with them, like Lawrence is saying. So you're like, oh, Tuesday and Friday are my days off, but what if you feel like you want to run through a wall on Tuesday? Why would you not train legs? But, it, you know, whereas if Wednesday's not supposed to be your off and you're like, uh, a, like Lauren said, an 8 out of 10 on soreness, maybe that should be your day off. And studies do show that you gain a lot more size and muscle with that. Your body doesn't know off days. It just knows how it feels at the time. That's a good point. It's a great point. So we talked a lot about Lawrence's workout program. Doc, how has your workout program kind of changed throughout the, the years? Well, that's a good question. So let's say like when, when I was really like into bodybuilding, you know, all throughout school, what I, it was very high volume very 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 high volume like 20 30 40 sets and stuff for everybody <laughs> for twice a day um six days a week That's when you get time. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly six days a week um and that was that so um and i had kind of, kind of more like of a um physique type of uh you know look 
But then everyone, but I didn't have, you know, I, I, it was probably around 180 at the time, but I'm like 5'8", but very lean. And everyone's like, oh, to get, but at the time, uh, physique sports weren't, it was like just heavyweight bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. So everyone's like, oh, you got to get bigger, you have to get bigger. So to do that, you have to power lift. And so for me, that was the worst thing I ever did for my physique was like pure power lifting. I went to pure power lifting and I got my squat up to about 500 pounds and my bench about 350 and I got really strong. I didn't gain size. Mm-hmm. And actually, my physique didn't look as well. So I think the ultimate, but then after that, I kind of did a combination of things. And it was probably ideal. It was mm-hmm. kind of like the combination that you're talking about. For me, my body has smaller joints. Mm-hmm. When I was, for my body, handling 500 pounds on a squat was a crap ton on my joints. I ended up tearing my quad. Um, and having I had, then, then that, that kind of healing, I tore my other one. Mm-hmm. And, um, <laughs> so it's true, it's true. So you kind of got to know your genetics. Also, Lawrence talks about how your body responds best. You have to know how your body responds best. So for me, my body really responds best to really high volume training. Um, and that's, that gave me my most success and the least amount of injuries. The majority of the injuries I ever got in my body were probably like that powerlifting phase was more like 10% of my career. Mm-hmm. And without it, my all my joints would probably be fine and all that stuff so that's why you have to train responsibly and like mm-hmm. lawrence said even now <clears throat> he does train heavy but he trains heavy response responsibly um charlie was a professional power lifter um and he'll tell you like he's got a lot of pain right now still everything you know, hurts everything hurts <laughs> mm-hmm. so you have to train responsibly and know there's a half-life to everything that you oh, do so true so I think we have one more. This is actually a really interesting one uh, to end on. What are, what's kind of difference in sarcoplasmic versus myofibular hypertrophy? How does that affect strength and power? Well, that's a great question. Okay. So uh, one thing, if you, look at, if you look at Lawrence, he's got both. Lawrence has fullness. That's sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, and that's the glycogen, the carbohydrates in the muscle, the fluid in the muscle. Lawrence talked about supplementing with electrolytes. The fluid... Uh, mitochondria fullness that's in the muscle that's non-contractile so when you see phil heat yes is Perfect. full mm-hmm. that's sarcoplasmic hypertrophy okay um and then myofibril hypertrophy is actually the muscle fibers themselves the myofibrils and that's the contr- that's trained by lifting heavy mm-hmm. so what lawrence talked about in our big interview was the fact that like if he goes super heavy and he loses like the high volume stuff he gets the density but he loses the fullness but if he just trains for like high volume, he'll lose the density. So it's having a combination of the two that get you the combination of both. And that's what Lawrence, I think, excels at. I think that's it, boys. All right, guys, thank you so much, Lawrence. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks, really guys, for tuning in. Thank you, guys. Oh, wait, wait. How can you follow Lawrence? To, to oh, Lawrence, tell, my tell. Um, stuff is just Lawrence Ballinger on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. And uh, yeah, check us out. And make sure... To, I'll always support Dr. Jacob and Aspie and make sure to follow their Aspie page as well. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate you lots. Anytime. Bye, guys. See you guys later.